I'm going to get it right up here close so I can preach to Janice. Got a few things I needed to clear up. <laughs> it's good to see everyone tonight. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, brief, uh, as uh, was mentioned a moment ago, three-part series. Um, we're talking about God's natural revelation. He speaks to us, uh, at least in a couple of ways. Some might add a third through our conscience, but uh, we would at least say that God speaks to us through his creation that we live in and are a part of, as well as his word. And I think it's important that as we uh, study God's creation, that we give priority and precedent to the word to help it interpret to us the significance and meaning of the natural world around us, and certainly to help us understand and interpret our own selves. And that's what we've tried to do in this study. And we've talked about uh, God's symbols that he's created and put into the world like rainbows and trees. And I think sometimes when we come to scripture, we think, well, what the scripture writers are doing is, is they're looking at trees and they're looking at rainbows and, and they're thinking, well, this, this could be like, you know, this, this gives me an idea that uh, God is like this or people are like this. And we just sort of use those as illustrations. Whereas I think it would be a more biblical approach to think that God, the author of scripture and the author of creation made rainbows and made trees and made other artifacts of creation the way that he did because he had in mind something he wanted to reveal about himself to us through those things. So it's not just us imposing a symbolic meaning on the artifacts of creation, but rather God using those to reveal truths, to reveal himself, to reveal important things that he wants us to understand. And I think that that's a really valuable thing. And I hope that, again, you've, you've enjoyed that study. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, astrological symbols sun, moon, and stars, and what God intends to communicate to us through them, how he wants us to understand them. As, as modern men and women, we tend to think of them in terms of things like, what are they made of? And how big are they? And how far away are they? And those are all legitimate questions for us to ask. But the, the ancients, uh, the pre-Capernian uh, our pre-Capernian predecessors would have looked at these and not necessarily asked those questions so much as questions of, questions of significance. What do they mean? And questions of purpose. Why are they there? And when we, when we look at those questions, we find biblical answers. And that's what I want to talk about for a little bit tonight. So what, let me just begin. Jarrett did a good job uh, last week of starting off with some questions. What do you think of when you think of the sun, the moon, and the stars? And specifically, if you were to think about what, what, why did God put them there? What is their purpose? And what do they mean? Or what do they signify? The sun was there for light. Okay, the sun was given for light. For light. I think that's very biblical. We'll see in a moment. Okay, for signs and for seasons. Very good. Also very biblical. Signs of what? They're there for signs and seasons, but there. For promises and prophecies. Stars for direction. People have navigated by the stars and the moon and the sun by, uh, again, uh, astrological bodies for as long as, as we know. Measuring time. Okay, measuring time, knowing how to, how to keep up with the, the calendar year, for example. Very, very true. All right, those are, those are all excellent, and I think many of them do come directly out of what we read in Genesis chapter 1 and verses 14 through 19, which is really going to form the basis of our study tonight. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures tonight and have to move pretty, at a pretty good clip and understand that we are literally, to use the expression, only touching the hem of the garment. This is a subject in and of itself that you could do three, four, five lessons on just about sun, moon, and stars. 
But it says in Genesis 1 verse 14 that God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times. And that's really the more literal translation, sacred times and days and years. So they are lights in the sky given to us to separate or distinguish between day and night and also to establish for us signs that mark sacred times and days and years. And he goes on, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, as Mark said, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern, notice that word, to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars, God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. So again, just in a very quick summary fashion, they're, they're lights that separate or distinguish between day and night. They're for signs and seasons or sacred festivals. They are for days and years. They are to illuminate the expanse and enlighten the earth. So uh, that gives us a, a good starting place. I've broken this down to about five different points that I want to consider tonight. And the first of these is that there are lights that are symbols of the glory of God and of his people. There are lights that are symbols of the glory of God and of his people. We've seen that he said that there are, there are lights, but what about this symbolizing the glory of God? And I want to be careful here that we make an important distinction I'm not saying that we can worship the sun, the moon, and the stars as representatives of God. In fact, we're explicitly forbidden from doing so. Do not bow down to these things and worship them as if they are God. But God does use them as symbols or illustrations of his glory and of the glory of others as well. So we can recognize that knowing that he is the creator of them and that they are signifying or symbolizing something without confusing them as an object of worship. So in Isaiah chapter 60, in verses 2 and 3, it says, See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Clearly, he is using the image of a sunrise, isn't he? So you've got this, this darkness, this time of gloom and despair, but, but the Lord, like the sun, is rising and his glory is beginning to manifest and appear over you. As a result, he says, nations will come to his light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So uh, here, I think, you, you see the idea of the Lord moving on his people and doing something that brings, that, that breaks the, the, the night and manifests the glory and the light of God as he begins to move and act in certain ways on behalf of his people. And he uses the symbology of a sunrise to describe God's acting on behalf of his people. In Daniel chapter 12 and in verse 3, we see that this also includes God's people being symbol, symbolically represented as stars. He says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. And Jesus, probably making reference to this passage, I think it's in Matthew 12, refers to the children of the kingdom as shining like stars forever. So we, uh, we are uh, also, uh, stars are also symbols then of God, God's people, and our righteousness uh, shines like them in a dark place, which is exactly what Paul makes mention of in Philippians 2, 14 and 15. And this is the first like, point of application I want to engage with you in. Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, says, do everything without grumbling or complaining or arguing. Do everything without grumbling or complaining or arguing. It sounds like we've completely left our discussion about stars and sun and moon. 
But why do you think he wants you and the Christians in Philippi to live our lives without that attitude that so characterizes the world, uh, attitude of grumbling and complaining all the time? Why would God want us to do differently? To be the light of the world, to, to establish a contrast between us and the world around us. Exactly. It's what he says in the next verse. Do this so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Isn't that beautiful? If you want to pop like a star shining against a velvet black sky and stand out and be different then don't be a complainer, don't be a whiner, don't be a person who's constantly going about with with a a complaining and negative attitude, but rather a person who is a representative of God, who is trying to do what is right and good, and to do it with a cheerful attitude. And Paul says, just that alone will set you apart, make you righteous and distinguish you from the general background, just like the stars stand out in the night sky. So lights can be symbols to us as we think about God and his righteousness rising up and we can, in times of our darkness, like those in the days of Isaiah, when things are gloomy, when things are bad, we can anticipate and yearn like one would wait for the morning for for the light of, of God to arise and to dispel the darkness and to gather and rally his people together. We can think of ourselves and our, and our fellow brothers and sisters as stars shining in the night sky and remind ourselves that we need to be distinct and different from the world around us so that people can see that we truly are his people. All right, uh, a second point. In Genesis uh, 1.14, again, we learn that the sun, moon, and stars were given to mark festival times, to mark seasons, some translations say, but more literally, to mark festival times. This is really fascinating to me. Again, I'll just show you the reference. Genesis 1.14, let them serve as signs to mark sacred or festival times and days and years. So think about that. The sun, the moon, and stars are given by God as signs to distinguish or mark out festival seasons. Let me show you an example of what that means. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, the law of Moses says the Lord's Passover begins at when? Twilight on the 14th day of the first month. And then on the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. Why, why do you think on the 14th, the, the twilight of the 14th, and then on the 15th is when the Passover would be celebrated? Well, I don't expect you to, to know the answer to that. But the Jews, some, some of you know this, the Jews followed a lunar calendar. We, we, we kind of do, but not exactly. We really don't. But they, they actually did. In other words, each month tracked with the phase of the moon, which is what? Like about a 27 or so day cycle, which interestingly falls a little bit short of 12 months in a year. So every three or four years, the Jews have to have what they call a leap month, okay? They, they don't just insert a leap, leap day like we do every so seven years to try to make our calendar fit the actual uh, moving of the motion of, of the solar system, but they had to ever so often insert an entire month to make up for the days that were, that were lost because they followed their months in accordance with the moon phases. And um, the beginning of the month would begin with a new moon. And then, um, if I get all this right, it would, it would come to the middle of the month. No, it would be a full moon, I guess. So they would come to the middle of the month, and that's when it would like disappear on its way down. And then that would be the twilight of the 14th. And then on the 15th, it would begin the development of a new moon. 
Okay, the old moon would be wa- uh, waning, and then beginning on the 15th, the new moon begins waxing, which is kind of fitting, especially for Passover, because Passover and the unleavened bread and all that was intended to do what? Distinguish the old from the new, right? We, we think about the blood of the Passover lamb, but Paul talks about uh, putting, purging the, the old leaven and all that. So it, it marks a, a new beginning and a new moon would mark the new beginning. And so they were to celebrate their Passover by watching the moon and uh, the first month of the year, which is when they were to celebrate that, by the way, was the first uh, cycle of the moon after the spring equinox. So you wait until the days become perfectly even in the springtime. And then in the first full cycle of the moon after that, boom, that's when you know it's time to celebrate Passover. So the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the moon here specifically was given to God's people so that they could govern their festival seasons. Do you see that? And there's actually a lot of other things in the law of Moses that told them how to do things and that they tracked with a lunar calendar in order to make that happen. Pretty interesting stuff to me. Now, the moon uh, also governs, we're told clearly, it governs the night. It governs the night. And here's an interesting point. There's a sense in which we can think of the whole old covenant period as being the period of nighttime. Okay? It it is the period of nighttime and in anticipation of the day. Which is interesting because the very final chapter of the Old Testament ends with a prophecy, doesn't it? It's a prophecy about the new covenant coming and the coming of Christ. And notice how Malachi in chapter 4, this final chapter of the Old Testament, describes this. He tells the righteous to, to hang in there. He says, but for you who fear my name, the Son, S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And it goes on to describe the coming of the new covenant. So the new covenant, probably this is a play on on words with the son of righteousness being a reference to Christ himself, but certainly the new covenant era. And he describes it in terms of the rising of the sun. And so just as the old covenant governed by these, this lunar system, governed in its festival celebrations by the phases of the moon, was a covenant of night and in anticipation of the rising of the sun of righteousness. And the new covenant can be thought of as taking place in the daytime under the reign of the sun of righteousness. And that makes sense to me, especially in view of what it said also in Genesis 1, when the way that the writer over and over repeats, he would say, evening and morning the first day. We think of day and then night, but biblically it's what? Evening and then morning. It's night and then day. And so the old covenant was the covenant of night. The new covenant is the covenant of day under the sun of righteousness, which is exactly, uh, I think, uh, well, let me just throw this in. Maybe that's why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, okay? Uh, But also, uh, we see that in the new covenant, we're no longer under these nighttime lunar uh, regulations, Paul writes to the Colossians and says, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ, who is our light, who is our sun, the sun of righteousness, who displaces the night. Any thoughts, comments, or questions on that? Is that clear as mud? All right. Number three, there are clocks for days and for years. That was, I don't have the reference to pop up again here, but that was explicitly stated that the sun and the moon especially are clocks for days and for years. And I just thought about that, that, you know, they really do establish a rhythm for life, don't they? What are some of the rhythms of life that just the sun and moon establish for us? 
high and low tide. Tide comes in, the tide goes out, right? Over and over. What, what would happen without that? The sea would become stagnant and dead, okay? So it establishes a rhythm for seas, which are so essential for the existence of life in the world. Just day follows night, right? Day follows night over and over again. What do you typically do at night? Some of you are doing it now. (laughs) You sleep at night, right? You rest, and then the sun comes up, and what do you do? You get up with the sun, and you go about your activities, and you rest in the evening, and you rise up and you work, and you rest in the evening, and the tides come in, and the tides go out. And what else happens as we now understand it? Orbit the sun. The seasons change. It's springtime and everything's bursting into new life. And then there's summer and there's the harvest of all the things that were sown in the springtime and the enjoyment of the fruits of our labor. And then comes fall, that sort of bittersweet, reflective season And then finally comes winter when it just seems that everything is dead. And yet we wait eagerly for a bursting forth of life again. You see that that God God has created a rhythm of life. And, And it has to do with these heavenly bodies, with these astrological signs, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they regulate our seasons, our days, our festival events. All of this waxes and wanes as God has built that into the very fabric of creation. Now bring that up because I think we're living in in this modern world with some of the technological advancements that we have made, and I'm not disparaging those. I'm very grateful for them. But sometimes it enables us to sort of live, we think at least, oblivious to those creational realities. And we have artificial light, and we have heating and cooling, and all of these different things that sort of insulate us from these more harsh realities of the, of the natural world that we live in, but it also sort of cuts us off from it, doesn't it? And how many of us, like our predecessors in ancient times, spend time at night just gazing at the stars and observing the moon and paying attention to whether it's waxing or waning and how close we are to a new month, not by looking at, uh, it's the 27th, but okay, I look at the moon and I see where we are in its face and I know from the flow of nature where we are. And I think that we we tend to to lose the sense of the cadence of life. And it has an almost dehumanizing effect on us. And I think we would do well to simply try as much as we can in a modern world to re-engage with that and think about why God made the world the way he did, and how can we fit into it properly? Well, that's just a little soapbox there. But number four, they also rule over the day and night and govern time. And I want to focus on the word rule and govern here. The sun and the moon especially, but the stars also are rulers and governors. Again, Genesis 1.16 He gave the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And so that's why the Old Testament was governed by the moon and the New Testament is governed by the sun of righteousness. But that word govern speaks to rule and power and authority. And have you ever noticed how the Bible uses the imagery of sun, moon, and stars to describe earthly authorities and powers and rulers, as well as angelic rulers and powers and authorities. For example, in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 9 and 10, Joseph, remember Joseph, he had a dream and he told it to his brothers. He said, listen guys, I had another dream and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. Um, A lot of commentators believe that the 11 would refer to their 11 and he was the 12th and believe that it refers to the 12 signs of the zodiac. Now that kind of freaks us out because we think of that as pagan astrology. But did you know that 
the Bible actually mentions any number of the uh, signs of the Zodiac, and they have uncovered a lot of uh, Judean synagogues that have signs of the Zodiac in a mosaic on the floor of the synagogue. So it's not at all far-fetched to think that that's something of that sort is what Joseph is describing. But the 11 uh, stars or constellations, perhaps, that represented each of the other tribes of Israel in in his brothers were bowing down to Joseph. And this, of course, uh, is signifying that they would be high and lifted up and exalted as would his mother and father, the sun and moon, but that Joseph would be exalted highly above all of them. And we also have many passages in the Scripture, both Old and New Testament, that talk about things like the sun refusing to shine or going dark, the moon turning to blood, and the stars falling from the sky. And one of the greatest mistakes that modern interpreters make of those passages is thinking that they refer to the end of the the universe, the end of time. But a careful study of those passages over and over and over reveals what? That they they refer to the end of what? Rule and authority of particular kingdoms. Maybe it's Babylon, or maybe it's Israel, or maybe uh, some other earthly kingdom. And they're represented by stars and moons and suns. Do we still represent earthly empires by stars, moons, and suns? What does the American flag have on it? (laughs) We have 50 stars representing the 50 states. What uh, What about far eastern flags? What do they typically have on them? Sometimes stars, but also a lot of times it's, it's the image of a rising sun. You'll see that in a lot of Far Eastern flags, rising sun. What about Middle Eastern? Moons, moons. Moons, stars, suns are still today pictured across the world on flags as representatives of, of their nation. And so... Uh, They rule, just like the sun and the moon and the stars literally rule the day, rule the night, rule the seasons. And so, uh, earthly rulers are often represented, as Joseph does in his dream, by the uh, likeness of stars and and sun and moon. All right, well, one more. Um, They're symbols of the heavenly host and the angelic human array around the throne of God. Um, the sun, I'm sorry, uh, they are symbols of the heavenly host, the angelic and human array around the throne of God. There's so many passages that we could look at on this, but one of my favorite is in Job 38, verses 6 and 7. Question is being asked of Job by God, on what were its footing, speaking of the earth, On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone, while the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for glory, shouted for joy, rather. So here he's describing God's act of creation, the creation event. And he and he says, the angels of God, the Bene Elohim is the Hebrew word, the angels of God, the sons of God were shouting for joy as God brought the material universe into creation. They're there, they're shouting for glory, and he describes them as morning stars. It says they sang together. And so there's a lot of this in the Old Testament where the stars are sort of used as symbols of the of the angels, of this host that's gathered around God as he performs this act of creation. Also in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5, we see not just the angels, but the human host also that will one day be gathered around the throne of God. It says in Genesis 15 verse 5 that God took Abraham outside and said, look up at the sky 
and count the stars, indeed if you can count, if you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So a promise is made to Abraham that his descendants will be as numerous as the sand on the seashore and as exalted as the stars and countless as the stars in the sky. And those stars represent what? People. What people? Yeah. First, the the Hebrew people, the literal descendants of Abraham by, by blood descent, and they did become a great nation. And we're told in the Old Testament that this prophecy, in one sense, was fulfilled with them. But in the book of Galatians and other places in the New Testament, we see that its ultimate fulfillment was not just in the literal physical descendants of Abraham, but who? Yeah, the children of the promise. And and we're told that by faith and through baptism, we are all children of Abraham. Okay, so what did Abraham see when he looked up at the night sky thousands of years ago? Well, you could say he saw you. He saw Lane, and he saw all of you gathered. He saw Janice, and everybody was up there in the stars of the sky. And Abraham, by faith, could see that his descendants would both be numerous and highly exalted. And I think that that's one of the important things that we should take away from this study, is that as we go out from time to time and look up into the night, time sky. We're looking at the same stars that Abraham saw, the stars that God promised him his descendants would be like, and that we're one of them. You know, there's that weird commercial where you can go to the National Star Re- International Star Registry or something and, and give someone a gift by naming a star after them. <laughs> Sounds like a money-making hoax to me, but nevertheless... It's actually true that these stars have names, and your name is assigned to one of them. And they represent God's glorious host of not only angels, but redeemed men and women who have been collected around the throne of God and will one day be in his presence singing his praises for eternity. For eternity. And that includes you and it includes me. Well, I meant to tell you at the beginning of this to pay careful attention because there would be a test at the end. And we've come to the place where it's time for the test. The book of Revelation is the most challenging book of the Bible. And one of the reasons that it's so challenging for us is because we don't know the rest of the Bible all of that well. We think sometimes we do, but we really don't, especially when it comes to some stuff like this. And sometimes even maybe some of you are out there thinking, oh, this is just, this is just too weird. You know, we need to get back to the real stuff. But there is so much of this is the real stuff in the way that the Bible is actually written and communicates to us. So when we come to the book of Revelation that that appeals to these things constantly, virtually every verse of the book of Revelation is either a quotation or a allusion to some Old Testament passage, it makes no sense to us because we have not learned to think the way uh, that the Jews would think, that a, a Hebraic sort of mind about these kinds of things. So one of the visions that John had in the book of Revelation. In fact, he calls it a great sign. He he saw a great sign appeared in heaven. So he's looking up and he sees a great sign. What does he see? He sees a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And she was pregnant, cried out in pain, as she was about to give birth. Now he goes on and the sign becomes even richer because he talks about a great red dragon. And what does that red dragon want to do? He wants to destroy or devour the child that this woman is about to give birth to. But he's unsuccessful because the woman gives birth to the child and the child is quickly caught up into heaven And the woman is ushered out into the wilderness where she can be protected for some period of days. 
And we're reading all that and we're like, I have no idea what any of this is supposed to mean. And I wish I could stand before you tonight and tell you with confidence that I know exactly what all of that means. But the test that I want to have as we wrap up tonight is just to open it up a little bit and see if we've learned anything about what some of this might mean. Who is this woman and why is she clothed with the sun? What's she doing standing on the moon? I've heard of the man in the moon, but this is the woman on the moon. And why is she wearing this crown of 12 stars on her head? Well, we may not, I don't want to get into the details of who this woman is because that, that will probably lead us astray. But why would this woman be clothed with the sun? Any ideas whatsoever? <laughs> okay. It's the light of day that the, we talked about. The old covenant was the period of night. The new covenant is the period of day. She's clothed in the sun. And maybe this suggests that we're entering into the period where the, where the sun is, is, is about to break through and shine. The sun of righteousness is rising with healing in his wings. Almost certainly the child that she's going to give birth to is that sun of righteousness, Jesus. So it's, it's daytime. That's good. Yes. Okay, 12 stars. The 12 tribes of Israel. Very good. So she's got 12 stars, and we notice that Joseph saw the 11 other stars bowing down to him, which would make the 12th star. So clearly this may reference the 12 tribes of Israel. She's crowned with that. So whether we understand fully what all of that might mean, it's most likely some symbolic reference to the 12 tribes of Israel, and she's wearing that like a crown on her head. So maybe she's a composite woman uh, that is representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. She's crowned with the glory of Israel. She's clothed in the sun, the radiance of the sun. It's daytime. Night is passing. The day is dawning. What else? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, a better understanding uh, of, of why uh, scholars have referred to in years gone by the Old Testament as the night time and the, and the New Covenant as the day. Very good. So she would sort of encompass all of that maybe because she's standing on the moon and clothed with the sun and has the 12 stars on, on her head. You know, maybe she's symbolic of, 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 of God's people throughout history and how God sees his people. And as I said a moment ago, she's going to come under attack by the fiery red dragon. Who's that? We, surely we can get that even though we haven't talked about it tonight. That's the devil. That's the evil behind all the other evils. And he's out to destroy her. But how does God see her? And what does God do for her? He protects her. And he preserves the life of her child. And he preserves her life, even though she's sent out into this wilderness. But God sees her as radiant, shining in, in, in the sun. God sees her as having authority and rule as she's clothed in the sun and standing on the moon and crowned with the stars. And so maybe we should come to see that that's how God sees the bride of Christ today, that we also are clothed with the sun, standing on the moon and have the 12 stars uh, on our brow. All right. Well, I hope again that this uh, short little series has been instructive and helpful in some way. I think if nothing else, it's a beginning place to try to learn to think a little bit more like people in Bible times likely thought about stuff when they saw a tree, when they saw the moon, or when they saw a rainbow. And we would do well, I think, to think those same kinds of thoughts after them. Well, I'll close with a prayer tonight, and then we will, uh, uh, do we have 
I forget what we do. Do we have someone who will, you have a closing prayer? Someone is designated to lead a closing prayer and we'll give them the opportunity to come before us and you can just hold this.